Hello, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show audio podcast. With your host, Kenneth Bacor. This is episode 11, recorded on May 1st, 2020. This episode of the EV Revolution Show is sponsored by File Sanctuary. Need a great web host for your business? Need to get email at yourdomain.com? They provide professional, feature-rich web and email hosting for any project you have in mind. Get started today at filesanctuary.net forward slash cloud and save 10% with promo code EV Rev Show. All right, well, welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show audio podcast, episode 11. I can't believe it's been almost a year since I did my last audio podcast. I was just looking back through the website and I see the last one was August of 2019. So it's been challenging to find some smart people to talk to that want to actually go and talk and be recorded. But I have found somebody and I want to welcome Peter Hadges. Did I pronounce that correct, Peter? Yep, that's right. All right. I should have asked you before we started, but you know, my viewers know me and my listeners that I'm kind of a spur of the moment when it comes to pronouncing names and just shooting things off the hip. So uh, welcome, Peter. Now, Peter is, uh, this is a long bio that I'm going to intro you on, Peter. Uh, You're a partner with the National Sector Leader Automotive side of KPMG in Canada, also managing director of KPMG Corporate Finance. You've got a lot of experience in mergers, acquisitions, and financing assignments for the public and private companies. You've also, you also serve as KPMG in Canada's national automotive sector leader. You've worked on across border assignments in Europe and the US and provided advice to shareholders and boards in a broad range of situations. You're also a member of KPMG's Global Executive Steering Committee, where you participate in monitoring and implementing the firm's global MA strategy. Welcome very much to the show, Peter. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for the introduction. As I catch my breath here. <laughs> so you're definitely an expert now of, to give some context to listeners, uh, you and I uh, bumped into each other at the uh, uh, Toronto International, Canadian International Auto Show in Toronto in February, when the shows were still going. We had a conversation, you shared uh, some findings, a report that you had published just af- around that time period regarding Canada's automotive future with a, a nice take on EVs and the whole electrified movement so what i thought is um after us trying to schedule this for a number of months and with the outbreak and pandemic and and everybody holed up i think there's a great opportunity for us to get together virtually here and uh and have a chat um yeah. so so what i'll do is I'll, I'll probably i'll just go through ask you some questions we can talk about that uh, i've got some material as i mentioned just before we started that we'll go through and hopefully this will be entertaining to the listeners just to get a sense of you know what what kind of year is 2020 going to be from an electric vehicle, from a plug-in perspective? I mean, we, we know the automotive scene in general uh, is, is taking a hit. It's going to all manufacturing, really. But many businesses are globally are taking a hit. A lot of things are down, but certainly the automotive sector is, is not immune to that. And um, as I try to follow what goes on in the EV side of things, um, let's start with kind of just before pandemic hit and, and this lockdown. We had very good momentum coming out of 2019 into 2020 with a lot of the OEMs putting, you know, billions of dollars, you know, setting aside, making statements, setting directions and policies that they want to go into electrification. You mentioned in your report, VW and some of the others. um, uh, How do you feel uh, that that direction is and how do you feel that it's going for those guys so far? Well, I think that's a, a good question and a backdrop to what's happened and where, you know, the OEMs were before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, took its toll on the economy. So let's take a look at that for a minute. Um, if you look at, say, North America's six majors, uh, I include uh, GM, Ford, uh, uh, Chrysler, Honda, Toyota, and Volkswagen, and again, that's a subset, uh, uh, just, a, just a subset, not all of them. They had a tremendous amount of liquidity, a tremendous amount of cash on December 31st, 2019, and that was in preparation for, uh, largely, not so, preparation for some of the capital investments they were going to make, continue to make, the development, and sort of... Um, 
run out and you know maturation of the production line as it related to electric vehicles. So if you looked at that number at December 31st, uh, cash and short-term investments alone were $243 billion. Those six alone. The big number. And a lot of people that was that was a big number. <laughs> that was a there, big number. You know, you know, and people looking back on it now retrospectively say, boy, they were prepared for this. Well, they were preparing for something else. But uh, you know, what what's happened is we've been uh, I guess had suspended operations for well, let's call it 45 days, a month to 45 days. Now a month is not you know, displace an economy or a world economy or an industry. However, the thing that is uncertain is when we return to uh, back into, you know, operating mode, will the consumers follow suit? And, you know, given that the inventory that's built up now, although I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an, it's an amount of inventory that's a, that's a um, huge impediment, but there's a lot of inventory that, None of it's being sold. The, the commencement, the recommencement of operations is expected to start around uh, May 4th, so shortly, but staggered. And, you know, the North American OEMs have said somewhere around, you know, May 18th, back to production. But, you know, it's a big supply chain, as you know, Ken. There's a lot of moving parts for this. So, you know, what, that requires a very coordinated effort, a global effort, because there's global supply chain. Um, you know, there's global technology development. So there's a lot at work. Having said all that, I think there's an interruption. So I see it as a significant interruption in the grand scheme of things. When we look five years out, mm, no. You know, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a sort of a optimistic in that, you know, we will manage the, the health concerns around the coronavirus. I think we've done a good job of it now. Uh, there are fatalities, of course, and that's terrible. but. You know, you have to understand those a little bit, too. Uh, my view is that, you know, our 13 million, we, we had predicted, as you recall, uh, there would be about 13 million electric vehicles to be produced annually starting in 2025. Um, do I think that's going to be materially different? Uh, I don't. I hope not. Uh, you know, maybe it's 11 million, maybe it's 12 million, but somewhere between, you know, 2025 uh and 2026 um you know we see the electric vehicle market starting to take hold uh, and we think that's still for the most part uh on the table saving except for one thing i'm going to qualify my there has been a fair amount of capital uh you know probably been used in these last uh, 45 days as, as operations are suspended um, you know, we'll have to look at the balance sheets and what they look like. You know, the concern really is, will the consumer return to his former spending uh, uh, habits? And, with, uh, and, you know, we'll be able to, will we be able to experience that? Because, you know, the auto industry, in my opinion, is the best beacon for consumer sentiment. It is always referred to. I don't know. It seems to have the spotlight all the time. How many how many car sales have we had? How many sales in North America? How many sales in the United States? Uh, everyone focuses in on that number, and because it's a big, durable good, and it's a real indicator of how confident people feel in terms of their uh, job prospects and job and cash and liquidity, uh, it's often it's often cited. Yeah, exactly. I mean, next to home purchases, you know, the the auto. Uh, is is the second biggest purchase. So those uh, both real estate, uh, the housing market, both consumer, a little bit of cons uh, commercial uh, builds, but uh, are definitely telltale signs of how uh, economic progress or reversals are happening. So I, I agree. I think you know uh, the OEMs will certainly be able to move forward from this. But you're right. You know that big ticket purchase, it's going to be a little bit more challenging in a lot of cases for consumers as they wait for confidence in their own jobs potentially and the markets and and the business sense of what happens over the next few months we know that you know as you mentioned some opening starting to happening that already a couple of states have have started to open up their business doors uh, things are happening here in canada a little sooner 
for some for other provinces versus others. So it is going to be a gradual uh, uh, reopening of, of the economy. Uh, it's really that job sector, as you mentioned, that, you know, if 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 I was in a situation where, you know, I, I've got to like, do I want to make a big ticket purchase in the second half of this year once once I get back to work? knowing that things are still kind of instability uh instable uh is that going to wear on, on people I don't, what's your thought on that i don't know i mean i i i look at uh you know my own family as consumers they don't seem to be troubled by anything they spend money like a wow. uh, <laughs> but uh you know i i don't know i i i had a conversation and it was a global call or a north american call uh, i guess there were global participants on it too so Canada's automotive group, and we were talking about sort of the trends in the U.S. and what's been happening. And, and there is a sense, there is a feeling that there is pent up demand. You know, there's a lot of ways to monitor um, you know, consumer interest. As you know, a lot of purchasers have access to uh, all the OEM websites. Uh, you know, they can configure cars all the time. Now, maybe a lot of people have time on their hands, so that's, that's all they do is configure cars. Uh, it seems to me that there is demand. I talked to dealers who are selling cars online, and maybe people will, you know, be more motivated to adopt that style of purchase. I suspect there's nothing quite like sitting in it, feeling in it, even if you don't need to drive it. So you just need to get a, an idea, perspective of size and shape. But having said all that, um, you know, I think there's a built-in cycle to some, a fair amount of vehicle ownership. Those that are leased. Uh, there's a natural cycle to renew, and I think that'll continue. Secondly, I think, uh, you know, we were talking about the car park, the average age of vehicles in, in the, um, the population, and it is aging. And technology, you know, just like we're talking about, whether it's uh, safety aspects to a vehicle, whether it's uh, how it's uh, how it's powered, is changing, changing, changing rapidly, and you know, making old vehicles very uh, challenged and obsolete almost uh, a lot quicker than they used to be. So I don't see that uh, retarding people's purchases. Again, I have a sense of optimism. I think as people get through this, and as we perhaps understand a little bit more about the the virus, and you can't talk about this without talking about you know, the COVID-19 virus, I don't think we understand exactly uh, everything we need to, who are the most vulnerable, what age groups are the most vulnerable, how much comorbidity comorbidity is there in the statistics. Um, you know, that, that's not very clear. It's still very early on that. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know, is the average, uh, you know, 20 to 45 year old a great deal of risk? I guess we'll have to find out. I'm not a, a epidemiologist or virologist, so I don't know. But I do read the stats, and, uh, you know, it seems to me that, you know, maybe uh, younger people, and maybe there is something to be said for uh, warmth and, uh, you know, summer climates and uh, open air, uh, open air, um, lack of open air transmission. So we'll see. We'll see what all that's about. Really, what it comes down to is, can we get the consumer confident enough that he's uh, they're out there, you know, purchasing products the way they used to and to the extent that they used to? That has dropped off significantly. I'm sure that, uh, you know, the credit card bills of North Americans are lower than they've been in a long time. Uh, and, hopefully, uh, and hopefully they'll return back to normal for the sake of the economy. I do think overall there's pent-up demand. I do think that's going to offset some uh, sort of hesitation around, you know, consumer purchases. I do think there's a built-in cycle uh, because uh, because a lot of vehicles are financed. Many vehicles are financed. Uh, and I do think there's a technology change that is motivating purchasers. So all in all, I see some uh, sort of slowed uh, entry back into the market. But I, I would like to believe that by September, October, you know, consumer confidence is strong enough that we're returning back to normal levels of sales. And I know that's somewhat optimistic because, uh, you know, that'll tell you that in the, in the fourth quarter, we're coming back to normal with a spike. But um, 
you know, I could see something like that. I just have a sense that, you know, that's what the market uh, will uh, will experience because, again, these are not purchases that you can forestall forever, particularly if you're using, um, you know, uh, light trucks as part of your uh, as part of your job profile, right? Absolutely. And I think um, also, you know, we know that governments are going to step in and try to drive and st- uh, stimulus packages for different sectors of the economy. You know, once the markets start opening up, they've all committed. You know, I mean, we're seeing it now with with just, you know, wage subsidies for now just to keep people, uh, you know, in, in houses, in, in apartments, or whatever, in rentals, just to keep food on the table. So I, I think the government's going to spend going to go into some massive debts around the world. To continue to pour stimulus in the hopes that 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 investment's going to pay itself back in in the next number of years as we rebuild and build up the economies again. So yeah, well, if I their agree. behavior, uh, if their behavior to date has been any indication, they sure uh, they sure don't seem uh, uh, you know scared of borrowing money. That's for sure. That's for sure. So obviously, then you know, coming into twenty twenty, there was a good momentum for auto sales, and if we focus on EVs in particular. You know, globally, um, the year finished okay. It was slightly down from uh, 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 2018 uh, years from a global plug-in perspective, um, but still finished uh, at around um, three to three to five percent, something like that. Um, The numbers of total auto light vehicle sales are are a little hard to find in checking different sites, but somewhere I think we finished around the the 67 million for total auto sales globally. And out of that, about 2.2 million were plug-ins led, of course, by Tesla um, as the number one global OEM in this particular market space, Um, you know, and and a few Chinese manufacturers in the top 10 with BMW, Volkswagen, Nissan, uh, Hyundai, and uh, Toyota kind of rounding off, you know, those top 10 numbers. So not a lot of surprise there. Uh, certainly the Model 3 being the anchor electric vehicle of the year at just over 300,000 units globally sold, which is phenomenal for, for Tesla. You know, I'm very happy for them. And it, it, you know, what it does is it shines the spotlight onto the marketplace to show the viability of, of EVs, that they, they can compete um, and that, you know, more OEMs need to step in. And the first three months from a Canadian perspective, you know, we're kind of echoing um, the, the decent trend that we saw, you know, um, from you mentioned the end of 2019 was pretty strong. Uh, Canada wide, we were just over 12,000 units for a plug-in um, numbers. And in the first quarter of this year, uh, ending March, we were just under 12,000. So it was only a couple of hundred unit difference. And that's pretty good considering that we really kind of started a, a slowdown in March uh, due to COVID um, and the pandemic. So to, to continue to see a fairly decent, strong EV sales going into the end of March. Now, I'm sure that that's going to, everything's going to uh, maybe not nosedive, but certainly dip downwards for this second quarter. I think the second quarter may be the hardest hit because yeah. this will be the longest lockdown. Um, and as you're saying, People aren't going out to buy things, really, other than lining up at the grocery store and LCBO. That's about it. So, uh, uh, but we're still, you know, we still maintained uh, 3.8% market share in Canada for the first quarter. Uh, What's your thought on how you, how those numbers look to you? Well, I I mean, they're pretty good. I mean, look, the, and, you know, market share is a function of uh, all the, all all the units you sell. So as that moves, market share moves around, but I'll tell you something. Tesla has proven, let's take Tesla first. Tesla has proven that there is market acceptance now. You know, you look at the, the Model 3, and they've achieved market acceptance. There's a, there's, a, there's a normalcy. People look at the car, they go, oh, that's Tesla, right? It's not, it's not as uh, unique or extraordinary as it was uh, two to three years ago, any Tesla product on the market. And then what happens is people, consumers, for whatever reason, through just through the act of observation, achieve a certain amount of confidence that that product, that technology, that method of propelling a car must be acceptable because look at how many I see. Yeah, I mean, so, I was know, so. know, <laughs> that guy must know something. He's driving one, so, you know, uh, maybe right. it's not so bad. And that gets people into the showroom and get people thinking about it because I do think it's a very big decision to go from 
the internal combustion engine to a different way of driving. And maybe the hybrid is the in-between, although hybrid has its benefits and drawbacks, right? Sometimes yeah. on the highway, the electric, the, the electric hybrid function doesn't really do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a pure electric car and, and, you know, the other thing that's appealing is, you know, for those that have driven them, uh, they know that, you know, from a performance standpoint, certainly from zero to hundred kilometers an hour, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite an experience <laughs> you know, with, uh, with the right car. In my lowly leaf, I still get uh, excited when I stomp at the accelerator. So <laughs> sure. 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 <laughs> it's a so, pretty nice feeling. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, my my sense of it is that you know, and 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 there's another thing that there's an overarching uh, consideration. The all of the the the, the major twelve, if we include Tesla, there's twelve major automotive factories. Follow everybody from you know Ford to Peugeot to Mercedes. Um, none of them other than Tesla, have really shown, really allowed their shareholders to experience uh, an improvement in the, in the stock. Despite all of them at the end of 2019, at the end of 2018, virtually all of them, as far as I know, I mean, even Tesla, positive earnings before interest tax, either dog. They're all positive. They're all making money. All of them. Even their last quarter, which just came out a few days ago, it was a small profit, but it was a profit nonetheless. So again, I, this is their fourth quarter now in a row of profitability. Yeah, as as late as January, and I haven't I haven't looked at it today. Tesla's market cap was bigger than Ford's. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. You that. Know, and it was so so the multiple applied to those earnings. Tesla does not have the earnings of Ford for all the readers listeners out there. Okay? It's not That's right. Not the same, but the multiple being applied to those earnings, the valuation of extremely favorable. The market and investors perceive Tesla as having a big advantage over all the other OEMs because they've invested a substantial amount of dollars into uh, you know their battery technology, and you know you can say battery technology is uh, you know pretty much advanced all the same. I'm not so sure. I think Tesla has made greater strides uh, recently in terms of, you know, duration and rechargeability and reprogrammability of their own vehicle. It's a different thing, right? Yeah, people who watch the show know that I say that, you know, from a BMS perspective, Tesla is by far one of the best, if not the planet so far. However, you know, I I am pretty surprised at the Koreans and maybe we'll circle back on that because whatever they're doing, they're doing something right. So they're doing something right. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. (laughs) We'll get to that. Yeah. (laughs) uh, So, you know, when you look at that, just getting back to this point about Tesla's market cap and all the other organs now are seeing that the market reward is rewarding companies. They can ultimately deal with what they perceive to be a legislative problem with greenhouse emission gases in five to 10 years from now. And if you don't get on the horse now, if you don't spend the capital now, because you you and I both know, Ken, these are, these are big programs. Converting, you know, making vehicles on a broad basis, on an assembly line efficiently, uh, profitably, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, you know, profitably, you know, and then the and the market punishes punishes OEM manufacturers that don't make profit. Punishes. So you know they've got to do all of that. You've got to invest in a lot of technology, a lot of know-how, a lot of product. It is a different kind of chassis. It's different. Yes, it doesn't have as many moving parts, but it has different parts. And it doesn't mean that those those, those you know that assembly process is as easy as everybody thinks it is. It's complex particularly with new launches. And we all know that an unsuccessful launch into a new vehicle that has a lot of problems uh, dissuades or uh, disappoints consumers. And then in this day and age, where you have so much social media and so much ability to assess the dependability and durability of a product, the last thing you want to do is make a huge conversion into a product that has a lot of problems. So with all that being said, um, I think that the existing OEMs are motivated 
for financial reasons, um, and you know, let's face it, they are motivated by financial reasons. But for financial reasons, because the stock market is rewarding uh, those companies that can see uh, the future and adapt to it quickly, and that's how they perceive Tesla. Now, Tesla may also be a takeover target, but my own perspective is that you know you can never count out big conglomerates like Volkswagen and GM and uh, and others. You know, they have a lot of know-how and they have they do have a lot of capital. Uh, and you know when they want to get to doing something, they'll they'll get to doing it. Um, so you know, um, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the the market share. It's really going to have to start to grow. I would say by next year. I mean, all these plans are now baked in. Uh, I, I I did uh, I did recall that uh, uh, Mercedes reiterated. I think as late as January February. 25% of their product by 2025 is going to be electric. So they keep saying that, <laughs> you know, whether everybody can do it or not, I don't know. But, you know, again, my, my projections come from what I read and they keep saying the same thing. So we, you know, apply, you know, tweak uh, our projections to their own uh, and, you know, we see what they say, but well, they yeah. seem to be on track and, and it makes sense to me because, you know, they've made commitments already. These, these these plans are when people say you know we're going to have twenty five percent you know uh, of our vehicles are going to be electric. Well, they probably plan that, and as the factory and factory commit to the changeover, the changeover sourcing supply and parts and everything else, that's probably going to happen. Yep, I totally agree, and you know I'm glad that you mentioned that fact about the time frames for you know especially the legacy OEMs to shift into newer territories like electrification. Um, I think they can all agree that there's a market. It's still a small market today, but there's a market and, and a big part of our future is into that marketplace. Where we see a, a market tipping point, you know, you, you listen to some analysts tell you it's, you know, like Tony Siva, it's it's already happening. I think, you know, I think as you do, that it's a long ways away from a total market tipping point, but we will get there in chunks. But those investments, as you say, they take years to pan out, right? You know, five to seven years to retool, make those investments. That's why when you hear VW talk about, you know, selling a million EVs by 2025, it's going to take them some time to get there, maybe 2026, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, but they are going to do it. So I get a lot of viewers and listeners that, you know, comment and email that, oh, VW is just making hype and just press releases and Ford and GM, but you got to start somewhere and you, and it does take time to roll these things out. And, you know, when you look at a company like VW with hundred and you know, uh, 30 some odd plants around the world, 600,000 workforce, you know, in, in all kinds of geographies. If anybody has got the muscle, the resources and the might do it, it's somebody like VW group, oh, yeah. um, you know, with their brands and everything. So, and, and, you know, it, it might seem slow to us. And I, I admit it, I get frustrated sometimes in listening to these announcements and going, gee, I wish, you know, Honda would kind of really do more or Toyota. Like, you know, let's, we won't go down that path today, but, um, it, I, I do understand that these things take, take time and I want to just ref, you know, end that, that, that comment about, you know, Tesla and their market leadership, you know, we have to remember all they do is battery electric vehicles. So by all stretch of the imagination, really, they should be the experts. They should be the leaders in that market because that's all they do. All the other OEMs do multiple products of different systems and different types and service, you know, service global markets for, for their reasons. So, you know, I expect Tesla to be the best because they should be, because that's all they, that's their bread and butter business. And, you know, going into, into the first quarter of this year, globally, you know, Tesla again is leading uh, the global brand sales. Uh, I've got some numbers here that are the first quarter of this year at just over 88,000 units a year to date for Tesla with again, very similar players in the top 10. I think VW is maybe a tad higher. Nissan's dropped the 10th, um, you know, they need to kick it up a notch uh, soon to, to start being more competitive. Um, but a lot of the same players and, you know, we're at a pace of about 460,000 for the first quarter, which if you do the numbers out times that by four, it's going to be well short of the 2 million uh, or 2.2 million that we did last year globally as a marketplace. Um, uh, you and I, I think both expect Q2 to be down for, for EVs and, yeah. and auto sales in general. So, where do you think the market, if you had to put your crystal ball on the table, 
where do you think the EV market may end up? You know, I mean, I, I doubt we'll hit two million, and there's some analysts are predicting potentially a thirty to forty five percent decrease in the EV market uh, uh, for this year. Okay, so uh, there's been a lot of talk about this one compared mm-hmm. to this, but I think that so let's talk about total units and the proportional drop. But I do think uh, that we are looking at a 35 to 40% decline this year over last year. So for people's reference, uh, last year we sell, and you know, in Canada, we sell about 1.9. Uh, it's almost 2 million, yep. Almost 2 million, 2 million in, in 2017. That was our big year. United States, about uh, 17 million, I think normal year or something like that and so this year you know if we get to a million and a quarter in canada and uh 14 you know maybe maybe across north america in total or 14 or 15 million against 20 again you're looking at 25 percent drop off so again i don't see why that wouldn't be proportional if anything yeah and this is the bad thing about being sort of a the small the small component of your of your war chest when you're trying to sell vehicles, trying to make some profit. You know, there's some steady, tried and true profit makers in the existing OEMs. You and I both know it. SUVs and trucks make a lot of money, and uh, they're mostly uh, internal, in, you know, com- uh, powered by an internal combustion engine. There's going to be a little bit more emphasis on that, I think, uh, just to juice the P&L. Uh, and to get the cash flow moving, that's not to say they're going to ignore electric cars, but I think it's going to be de-emphasized. So if we see a 25% drop in the conventional platforms, you'd probably see as much as 30 to 35% in the electric vehicles, not because anyone's abandoning the technology and not because you know, anyone doesn't think this has a future. But you know what? The cash flow pressures are what they are. They're mounting. and um, which cars you're you're the production guy, Ken? Which cars are you gonna are you gonna pick to produce? If you exactly. got you know four months to go, yep. I can tell you you're probably picking a lot of those pickup trucks and SUVs where you make a lot of money. That's for sure because when that confidence comes back in the fall in the latter quarters of this year, uh, and people want to get out and spend, I want to be able to have the most profitable stuff on the lot for them to buy, right? Yeah. So I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. So if we can agree. And who knows whether we'll agree, but let's say 25% is the conventional drop. I think you're going to expect another 10 percentage points on top of that, 35% in the electric the electric business. So, you know, if we were 2 million before, maybe we'll be million six fifty. Who knows? Uh, you know, million five, million four, uh, you know, million three fifty, million four, something like that. Yeah, you know, in some of the other countries that have, you know, potentially China that's come out of this a little sooner than everybody else, uh, you know, they might pick up some of that slack and, and maybe overachieve, yeah. you know, who knows. They've they've been back and forth with their incentives and we won't go a lot into to that marketplace, but you know, there are other global marketplaces that that have, you know, nowhere to go but up as well. So, um, you know, maybe we'll see some of that that differentiation uh, picked up in those marketplaces. Uh, but I, I think I think those numbers that you projected are pretty valid. Um, you know, I've talked to some people about this drop, and they get all scared and go, "Oh, and down." And I say, "Well, don't. It's just the whole market in general is going to be down this year. It's as you say, it's relative perspective to that market." Yeah, I don't read anything into that. I really don't. This is an interruption that was unanticipated. Yeah. I don't want you know uh, listeners to think you know this is sort of the uh, some kind of big setback for electric vehicles. I don't perceive that. I don't believe it. And I, and I don't think uh, that's in the long-term plans of any of the OEMs. Like I said, there's already been commitment that are irreversible, but you know what? Very difficult to reverse. Um, uh, and the, you know, dollars committed and capital committed in the auto industry needs to generate a return and they're going to make it generate a return. And in my view, that's going to, uh, lead to production if it's not in 2025 where we hit the 13 million maybe it'll be 2026 so again this year maybe we're only at 25 percent reduction maybe 
maybe it won't be as bad as 35 percent we'll see but you know my hope is my hope is this will this will allow uh you know maybe uh you know the engineers to have that brief sober pause you know work on really you know modifying and, and making their their electric platform uh more refined uh, and who knows it may speed up the process at the end of the day when when it really gets rolling, I really would like to see, you know, I really would like to see the advancements that, that Tesla is making on recharging time. You and I have talked about this before, but, you know, you fill up a car with fuel, it takes about seven minutes. Four to seven, depending on how much you put in and how quick you are with your credit card. You know, that is something that the North American consumer Day, we'll we'll have to battle no matter no matter what, and you know you're going to have to charge your car for unforeseen uh, reasons, and you know that's going to really uh, that that if that can be overcome in some way, and I'm not saying seven minutes needs to be the benchmark, but you know 15 to 20 is not too bad, uh, and obviously charging at home doesn't cause you a problem because you know, you're moving around all day, but sometimes you know you run into unanticipated issues as we all know. So uh, the charging time, the, thing, the strides that Tesla's made there are very good. And I think if they can keep at it, and maybe they've reached a theoretical maximum. I don't think so. I do think there are some more from what I've read. And again, I'm not a, a, a battery engineer, but uh, from what I've read, there's some changes coming too. There could be more improvements. And that's very exciting. Very exciting for the consumer. Very much so, and and those are good points. I mean, this decade, I believe, is going to be unprecedented in the tech, technological growth of that EV marketplace. You know, with things like faster charging, with things like better battery technology, you know, more density in in a same physical footprint or smaller physical footprint. You know, which everybody's striving for. You know, I think we're at we're at that sweet spot from a range battery, you know, sizing perspective. Now it's just a matter of, as you said, Peter. Let's get that gas station like experience, you know, closer that we can from an EV charging where where it's needed. And I think strides are being taken. You know, we're seeing 350 kilowatt charging, you know, come out in, in vehicles, which will 80 percent in, in 10 to 15 minutes. I mean, you're starting to get down to those experiences and, and this and we're only at 2020. So never mind into 2030. But you're right that that is a barrier, potentially a barrier to adoption for people that aren't, you know, for the the ice fee business has been around over a hundred years. So there's a, there's a really established mindset around that. And, and it, you know, I think in, in this decade, we'll see that shift to a different mindset as, you know, some of the younger buyers are starting to get into their, you know, out of college universities working and, and built families and all that stuff. And into buying, uh, they, they will, they will understand and, and, and accept this kind of technology a little bit easier. Funny though, but most of the EV people that I know are older people <laughs> like myself, and that's mainly an affordability aspect, right? I mean, you know, Tesla's opened yeah. it up for a little more younger crowd, so I, we do see them. But you know, if you do a demographic graphic, the traditional EV owner is you know probably forty-five to seventy or something like that, or sixty-five. Um, so it's interesting, but that's an affordability aspect. But great points. I mean, I wanted. To, I'm glad we talked about that because charging infrastructure is going to continue to develop and just get better. One question I wanted to ask you, you mentioned in your report about the environmental awareness around EVs and the, and the, about electrification. And my thought is that with, with what's going on now, um, I think that when we come out of this, I think the awareness is going to be heightened and even more acute than it might've been, than it would have been prior to, to this thing happening. And, you know, is that, is that a leverage that we can use in, in, in the consumer marketplace? I mean, take the economics aside, knowing that OEMs are going to be pushing their, their higher GP products, you know, for the remainder of this year to recoup those losses. But if we go get past that, is there, you know, can we message the, the validity of the EV marketplace rel relative to environmental and health benefits? Because that's something that tends to get overlooked. And, you know, if you, I, I think there are studies out now about, uh, areas and regions that have been harder hit by COVID because of the air pollution, you know, that they have like LA and, and China and India and New York and some of these areas, um, that there is a correlation of data that, you know, where there's higher uh, smog and these kind of things, it's a higher or more serious cases of COVID relative to the numbers. 
is that something do you think that that will continue in on people's minds moving forward well i think that he um Oddly enough, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, has brought to light just how much of an impact we have on the environment, judging by the number of squirrels running around my neighborhood. Uh, That's true, know, yeah. Uh, nature and, nature and, has come back, yeah. Oh, yeah, birds and animals and foxes and, you know, you name it. Uh, we do have an impact. OEMs know very, very well. That governments these days are becoming more aware. They're pushed by their constituency. They're pushed by the electorate. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be a real problem. Greenhouse gas emissions is going to be a real problem. It's not, not a problem somewhere way off into the future. You know, the electorate believes it to be a problem. Governments believe it to be a problem. And so OEMs are responding by making sure that they can satisfy government legislation. You know, we all know. There are some countries that have set targets now for you know, the elimination of the combustion engine in, uh, in another 15 years or so. Uh, but having said all that, do I think that this has uh, heightened everybody's awareness around health and concerns over the environment? I do. I think that um, you, know, you just look at the, the amount of traffic, uh, automobile traffic that, that has it has reduced in its uh, normal flow during the day. You know, it's really changed the environment in every major city that you go in. You know, you look up at the sky and see the shots, the it's clearer, it's fresher, and it's, it's different, noticeably. Toronto's noticeable. Um, so, you know, my view is yes, it has an impact. Yes, I think that does motivate people. Obviously, you know, you always got to be careful when you say these things because the production of electricity. Uh, isn't always uh, clean, depending on you know where you live in the region in North America. You use coal-fired uh, you know stations. It's not necessarily uh, you know, the net benefit's not always great. But you feel the layers back a little bit, and I think you gotta feel it back, but you got to yeah. start somewhere too. And uh, uh, look, I, I I think yes, I think there's going to be a greater awareness. Again, just getting back to you know, charging times or whatever, everyone talks about range anxiety, you know, and the range of the battery and how far it'll take it. This all disappears, you know, as long as you can charge it, there's enough stations. And, and again, for listeners, you know, I always ask this trick question, how many gas stations there are in Canada? So I'll, I'll give you the answer. There's only about 12,000. It's not that big a deal, you know, to... Uh, Either convert, add on, augment. I shouldn't say it's not a big deal. It, I mean, it's it's a cost for sure. But if you had quick charge times and you you could um, sort of uh, image your charging station something like modern gas stations, knowing that you can still charge it at home because you don't need as many, I think you're going to be in good shape. So I think the industry is well poised from that perspective. I think you're right. I think there is environmental awareness where people are going to say look this is a cleaner better option for me to get around in um an economical one at least right now i think that's important absolutely i totally agree with you um a couple other things i just want to cover before we uh, finish on the show here um about you know the technology we know it's advancing we talked a little bit about that in charging and batteries um but there's all kinds of other things that tend to be coming out um, in some cases more on EVs, you know, I mean, Tesla with their full self driving, uh, which isn't hundred percent there yet, but they've been testing it for a while. You know, we know Cadillac has a really good, almost full self driving uh, assist uh, mechanism as well, which is really good. Um, but you know, more stuff, you know, facial recognition, biometric vehicle access, you know, active health monitoring, uh different things with regards to manufacturing with reconfigurable body panels and um you know window displays i remember i think the new id3 has got a a large amount of of a hud type space i believe uh for you know for nav and for you know turn signals in the windshield and this kind of stuff so you can see things um and what's your take on 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 the future i mean how this is going to happen unfold over the next few years and and canada's contribution to that well, look at this is the name of the game uh, next to electrification and different propulsion. Vehicles are going to be a lot safer. Um, you know, the 
you know, uh, deaths and the deaths per capita have gone down steadily. Uh, fatalities have gone down. Traffic fatalities have gone down steadily. I firmly believe it's because cars are safer, better, better to drive. They brake better. And with these monitoring systems that are being introduced into vehicles, um, and I think, and I think, you know, again, you know, uh, listeners should understand that, you know, much of this technology was introduced to safeguard the driver uh, and and just to create their their safety measures. They just happen to be uh, have the capability to sort of steer the car on its own when it required. Yeah, I remember uh, just basic cruise control. I got pretty excited <laughs> over that. Yeah. You know, back in the seventies, right? <laughs> yeah. So. But you know, I, I think it's going to be a very a much safer environment. I think that's the third body. I, I foresee insurance costs going down. That's a good thing. I think that uh, these technologies, you know, sure they're going to be hampered by weather and environments and the location that you're in. But you know, they will advance so that they're not always visible. Some of them are radar based. Uh, the roads and infrastructure will change to accommodate that over time. I think it's a great development. I, I'm personally very excited about that. People, people have asked me, will it take the fun out of driving? And um, my response is, as long as the buttons are there to turn it off, no. Uh, but, you know, the, the interesting thing will be as these things advance, and who knows whether you and I will be here, Ken, when we see this, but if it comes to the point where automation is a real viable uh, alternative to human input there is no doubt that humans cause more of the accidents than the vehicles themselves as we all know it's human error uh, and when this is should this the day come uh, the biggest issue you're going to have is you're not going to want humans uh, driving vehicles amongst uh, those that are controlled by a computer so, you know, my worry is that uh, we're either going to have segregated ways of driving or, you know, uh, the option to drive your car on your own. Either. That doesn't mean you can't drive it somewhere else, but, uh, you know, I hope that doesn't happen. But it, it will be very difficult to, to co-mingle human interaction with computer interaction. Yeah, very good point. And I, I've, I've said the same thing. I think that's that's where it gets a little dicey when we're in that stage, you know, once we're all in, then it's a different story. Um, but you know, when you've got that, that early mix, you know, as we start moving towards more, uh, self-driving type of, uh, uh, of applications and deployments, those early ones, I think are where it becomes very, very, uh, nervous, you know, until we, we get, I mean, the ultimate, uh, I guess, um, end of the tunnel on that would be that all cars are connected so they're all communicating at you know very very quick speeds faster than we can and they know where they are and they have sensors and they can react much faster than we are even if we try to be stupid as a driver right but we're, not, we're not there make, yet yeah yeah <laughs> certainly make uh if that were all true all this technology was available any COVID 19 tracking uh abilities yeah. that you required uh, you know you'd get for sure, for sure. Uh, no, absolutely agree with you on that. And one last thing I want to close on then is, I mean, you know, just recently, um, and, and it was on plan, I just, you know, about a week or so ago, when we saw oil, uh, especially U.S. oil, I believe it was the, the West Texas Brent, <laughs> yeah, yeah. drop, you know, to a negative number first time his, in history, um, that had to open some eyes. I mean, how do we see the oil industry now at such low prices. Uh, I mean, obviously they're not going away. You know, you and I agree that ICE fee is around. I tell people internal combustion vehicles are around for decades still. It's not an overnight shift. I mean, nobody's producing enough a year to, to get rid of them anyway fast. So that's going to take a while. But, you know, where what's the future of, of oil and where do we see, you know, what's going to happen with all this? Biggest problem with oil that I see, Ken, is that it's got so many, um, you know, artificial inputs is the wrong word, but so many influences around its supply. You know, if the price falls down to the point where, you know, you're paying people to, to, to take it, you know, you won't be producing anymore. Trust me. If this persists for a long time. We'll have to go to electric. I know, sure. I know that's not going to happen, but. Um, Look, I, I see it recovering. I see that uh, you know there was a big gamble there by 
fired the shot, obviously, and, you know, people didn't want to back down and started producing. Who knows what kind of pressure they expected to put on, you know, North American shale producers. Not sure. Not sure what the motivations were. You know, they uh, and the cartel and the, the oil producers of all people know the laws of supply and demand. All producers, all makers of things, they know it very well. Whatever they were trying to do and whatever their motivations were, it just goes to show you we artificially uh, uh, affect the market like that. You know, you better have a phenomenal amount of staying power because prices can become very volatile and change. So I don't think it's going to persist, number one. They can't afford it to. Uh, they can't afford it for sure. And, you know, number two, uh, part of it, part of that decline in price has been affected by a very unusual event. We, we shut down the global economy at the same time, for the most part. Uh, you know, and, and what's been affected is some of the world's biggest consumer markets. Uh, Germany, the United States, Spain, France, Italy, uh, Sweden, um, you know, all of Canada and the United States. That, that's a big consumer market to shut down. And also the, the industries that are drawing upon that marketplace. So not just consumer automotive transportation, but commercial transportation, yeah. air transportation, rail. I mean, you know, for the most part, everything is, is pretty well shut down with, yeah. with the airline or, or minimize, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so there are factors here coupled with, I don't know, just a bad strategic move. I do not understand what the producers as well were thinking, particularly in this environment, uh, probably to gain some kind of strategic advantage. That's proven to be very possible. Any final thoughts? We've talked a lot, probably more of our conversation regarding North America, but from a, a global perspective, Peter, um, you know, what, what we see, what we've talked about is where we see that the market's going here in North America, where we see some of those trends. Is it your feeling that we're, we're pretty well mimicking what's going to happen around the rest of the world for most of the major markets? Is that a fair assumption? I think so, Ken. I will tell you that as a result of this pandemic, the, the result of this COVID pathogen. You know, I would say that um, there will be inevitably a rethinking of how products are manufactured, how insular uh, economies become. Um, it is clear that, you know, a global supply chain has its benefits and has its weaknesses. And uh, I think there's going to be some changes there. Um, you know, I, I, by nature, I'm a free trader. I think that free trade makes a lot of sense. But, you know, you've got to have all the participants, uh, you know, playing by the same rule book. And, um, you know, things are more complicated than they were uh, 200 years ago when, you know, you were trading wheat for oil. Weed. Just want to make sure <laughs> we understand that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new it's a new time here too no you're absolutely correct and you know ho so hopefully we've given listeners some food for thought you know we'll, yeah. i'll have to listen watch or listen back to the show you know come january february about a year or so from now just to see how close we were in our kind of <laughs> yeah, crystal ball, right. loose on the spot projections here predictions that we were but i think the takeaway is is for the listeners that you know uh, the entire this is this is unprecedented times right we've heard this many times We've never gone through something like this, even during war, major war events, uh, World War One, World War Two, especially. I mean, the economies haven't haven't been hit like this. So um, we're in uncharted territory. Things are going to react differently, but you know, we will overcome this. We're already starting to see some signs of recovery early, which is positive. Um, we will see the, mar the the economies and the markets bounce back. To what degree, though? That's again going to be different, and it's going to be, as you said, Peter. I think a rethinking and, and, and a slower, a different approach to things, a different mindset for a lot of areas, especially in, in the automobile market space. The, but, you know, that momentum that EVs has been gaining in market share and in acceptance over the last several years, I think will continue to go. It, you may see this hiccup where, again, all the numbers are going to downshift for a bit and then go start moving forward again. Um, but certainly from an e electric vehicle perspective, um, they are here to stay. And if anything, that market is going to continue to grow uh, as it is anticipated to. You, would you agree with that? I agree. Yeah.
we've covered off a lot of stuff. Boy, I'm tired. That was a lot of a lot of brain power. Well, I want to thank you again, Peter Hadges, partner, national sector leader in automotive and managing director at KPMG Corporate Finance in, here in Canada. Thank you very much, Peter, for taking you know almost an hour out of your day now to spend with me and to enlighten uh, my listeners about uh, what we feel is going to happen here. Well, thanks for having me, Ken. Look forward to the next time. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll definitely keep in touch and uh, enjoy the rest of your time uh, in uh, lockdown mode. But uh, I'm hearing rumblings here in Ontario that you know we might start seeing some loosening of that come mid, mid to end of May. So maybe a couple more weeks for us. Who knows? We'll see. But thank you very much. Stay safe, P- uh, Peter, and all the best to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. And for everybody listening, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the audio podcast. Please, I hope everybody is staying safe and following uh, public guidelines wherever you live. And until the next show, um, you know how to find me. You can always watch my videos at the EV Revolution channel on YouTube. Please check those out as well and subscribe. And I'll try to get a little bit more frequent on these podcasts as we move forward. Again, it's just tough to find people sometimes that want to talk. Anyway. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Take care, and we'll talk to you next time.